have you had any encounters with COVID-19 and could you describe them and the symptoms that you've seen with patients with COVID-19? I'm primarily a neurologist and neurointensivist, um, but you know, given the volume of patients in the surge in New York City, we've had we've been all anyone with any critical care background has been pulled to take care of the COVID patients. So um, I alternate my time between uh, taking care of COVID patients at night and during the day, and then taking care of neuro or surgically critically ill patients. So uh, what I can say is the COVID patients are extremely sick. This is um, you know, ARDS to the exponential level. Um, they're much sicker than um, the patients we typically care for. And, um, you know, in terms of uh, what we're seeing neurologically, it's a spectrum. And I think we're probably underestimating what's happening neurologically with these patients because they're all sedated, uh, oftentimes paralyzed. We don't have a neurological exam on them. Um, there's not enough imaging really being done on these patients for many reasons. One, they're hard to transport uh, because they're medically unstable. And then, um, you know, second, it's, it's a resource uh, situation where, um, you know, everyone is doing, you know, extra work and stretch to the, to the um, extent that they can. Um, and then, you know, uh, there's often not necessarily clinical suspicion because we can't examine these patients. And so right now we're finding just as we're starting to try to wake people up to try to wean them off the ventilator that um, some of these patients aren't waking up and that they have actually profound hypoxic injury. Even if they didn't have a cardiac arrest, we're seeing imaging uh, that looks like patients with cardiac arrest. That's how profound the hypoxic anoxic brain injury is in some of these folks. Um, we've seen other spectrums of uh, neurological issues anywhere from just straightforward encephalopathy, which is very common, right? Because you have patients uh, without sleep-wake cycles um, on various sedations and drugs. And so they're gonna be either have delirium or some version of encephalopathy. A lot of them are uremic because the um, coincidence of renal failure is so high in these patients because of the, um, probably the ACE2 receptor um, expression in the kidneys is, is, is so high. Um, then we're also seeing things that uh, could be uh, directly related to, to viral, the virus um, in the CNS or peripheral nervous system, and then also post-infectious complications. So for direct viral complications, now we, no one's been able to isolate uh, SARS-CoV-2 in the CSF. Uh, I think there was one report of, of this being done, but it's unclear if there was some cross-contamination or if that was truly positive in the CSF. Um, issues may be that the assays that we're currently using for the serum are not sensitive for that kind of uh, biospecimen, um, or that there frankly is not uh, actually a virus in the, the passing the blood-brain barrier. We don't know that yet. Um, there are uh, ACE2 receptors are displayed on glio, cells, oligodendrocytes, neurons, but it's not, uh, it's not clear that they're, they're displayed in enough density that, that there is true neuroinvasion. Now, one thing that we've thought for a while is that a lot of these patients have a lack of smell, lack of taste. It makes sense that the virus could potentially be traveling retrograde, like up through the cribriform plate, then retrograde along the olfactory bulbs into the skull base. But Again, this is just conjecture at this point. We don't really have good pathologic data to, to, to back that up yet. Um, other things that we were seeing early on was a lot of these patients were syncopizing. They had um, lack of dyspnea. Um, there was, it was disproportionately uh, non-dyspneic compared to their level of hypoxia. So patients would be sitting around like, sometimes people call it happy hypoxia, where they're feeling fine, but their oxygen levels are super low. Um, and normally, uh, patients would be more dyspneic in those circumstances. And so people also conjectured that maybe there is reticular activating system brainstem level involvement that's suppressing some of these respiratory drive reflexes. Um, same thing for the syncope, that maybe that's reticular activating system mediated, because it's not common to syncopize in the context of pneumonia, for example. Um, so that's a curious finding. And then um, we are also seeing what looks like potentially sympathetic storming or dysautonomia or uh, cytokine storming where, you know, not only would people have fluctuations in 
uh, blood pressure, heart rate, uh, but uh, diaphoresis, um, hyperthermia, but also sometimes these um, abnormal movements that look like posturing that we see in like traumatic brain injury patients that are dysautonomic or have sympathetic storming. Um, we were seeing that in some of these COVID-19 patients. And initially, um, you know, they do look seizure-like, so that, that uh, but we've had some patients who we've captured the movements and there's no EEG correlate, right? But they're very dysautonomic. So it makes us believe perhaps there's a storming component here. Um, we're still at the point of collecting data um, to try to back up these hypotheses. So this, um, right now, these are observations. I wouldn't say that we've proven anything yet, um, other than, you know, we have observed seizures also in these patients um, that, that, that can occur. Um, people have described encephalitis in these patients. We've had patients with Guillain-Barre coming through, um, which of course is a post-infectious manifestation. In most cases, we may see a, uh, another spike in Guillain-Barre because it usually occurs, as you know, like uh, within you know, weeks to a couple of months after the initial infection. So that may still be coming. We're still like in the midst of this um, kind of surge, at least in New York City. So I think um, a lot of data is rolling in every day. It's, you know, we get more information and, and so it seems to be changing by the moment. Um, but uh, uh, strokes also, um, and we get to this point where we don't know how much is casual versus causal right? Because strokes happen at a high frequency in the population. Anyway, um, if the seroprevalence is as high as we believe it is, so like these um, prevalence studies in New York that they just reported yesterday being like 21% uh, prevalence, seroprevalence in New York City, um, you know, it's, you start to think like maybe they are not necessarily related. That being said, the hypercoagulable uh, prothrombotic state associated with the cytokine inflammatory response in COVID certainly could predispose you to having um, cerebral thrombosis. So um, a lot to kind of parse through still. Luckily, we have a lot of data. We, luckily or not luckily, I mean, it's unfortunate, certainly for New York City, um, but it is an opportunity to learn more about the virus as we have a lot of patients coming through.